I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot, America's Creek Devil. Chuck, this is a friend of yours that's had some experiences. Would you like to spearhead this one? Sure, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to welcome Sean to the show. Sean is... um, me and Sean go way back, and and he kind of helped me get started with what I'm doing. So, uh, Sean, just uh, take it away and talk about your encounters and, and what, what's been happening. All right, I sure will. Hey, guys, how are, how's everybody doing? We're doing very good. So, uh, awesome, awesome. Uh, you know, I kind of got into this as uh, as a kind of a whim, Uh I had lost my uh, my deer lease in Texas, and for about a year, two years, I, I was uh, itching to get back out into the woods. And I went down a rabbit hole, which I am grateful that I did. I came across a website that uh, had Bigfoot expeditions, and I was a believer at the time. Uh, you know, I had seen the the Patty film and all that, and I kind of thought it was a joke. So I went on my first expedition back in 2008, uh, just as a, just kind of like on a whim, um, uh, thought it was kind of a joke. And I met some wonderful people, saw some great videos. And from there, I was a little, I was intrigued. And then the second expedition was like four months later. And uh, Sibylla Irwin was on that. That was one of her first expeditions. And it was in Southeast Oklahoma. And I had gotten up there on a Thursday night. And we were, a bunch of us were sitting up on a deck. And the organizer said, you know, some people talk about wood knocks possibly being being done with hands instead of logs and, and things like that. And we're up on this deck. And the organizer did two loud claps. And sure enough, within 10 seconds, 20 seconds, to the east of us, we had gotten a wood knock. And to the west of us, along the same creek, they had, we had gotten another uh, wood knock. And then everybody just, <laughs> it got serious then, you know. And um, we did it again, got another one. but but it was closer, both the east and west got closer. And Sibylla Irwin was putting up her tent down in a field about two, 300 yards in front of us toward this creek. And, you know, everybody's excited. And of course, when you first get to a site, you don't have your cameras uh, set up. Uh, you don't have anything really set up, which is, which is a complete mistake. When you leave the house, you set everything up because <laughs> you just never know when something's going to happen. Um, we did a third clapping sound. The one on the west, we didn't hear anything else back. Well, the one on the east now is in front of Sibella and her group. And Sibella is watching this animal, creature, uh, in a thermal. Of course, she didn't have the the DVR hooked up to it. So for about 20, 30 minutes, it may have even been longer. Her group was sitting there watching this uh, Bigfoot through the, through the woods. So that was really my first uh, introduction to Bigfoot. And then it just kind of spiraled out of control for a little bit. You know, it was all I could do to go to as many conferences and watched every show trying to figure out what this animal was. Uh, with that being said, it took me seven years from that date before I had my first sighting. Uh, and that was down in, in Cold Springs, Texas, in the big thicket. There were uh, seven of us uh, camped out, and it was called the Hunter's Camp. And basically what it was was it was down a dirt road, 
and there was a cul-de-sac and on either side of the cul-de-sac it was very thick uh with vines and everything else you know because it's all down there in the the piney woods but the back of it was thinned out where people would camp so that's where we set up our camp for the night and then uh probably about 7 38 o'clock that night we went out and we went out in two groups but we were together and we had uh kind of a guy from the area who said let's go down to this wellhead you know we've had uh we had wood knocks and calls down there and let's just go down there and see what we can kick up. And sure enough, the first call that I had made, uh, I'd gotten a call back, made a second call, got a call back. Um, and everybody was pretty excited about that. We were down there for about, about 45 minutes to an hour trying to triangulate where this animal might be, which, uh, we weren't very successful. So we came back up and there was, there's a road called Spooky. I want to say it's Spooky Road or, or something similar to that. And basically off one of the main trails, it goes down for about a quarter mile, maybe a mile or a half mile. It dog legs to the left. And the Spooky Road is not too far, probably about 400 yards from where our campsite was. So five of us walked down this road and uh, it was blocked off so the other group was sitting up in a car and they were filming they had a um, thermal that was face down where we were walking we walked down there and didn't have anything while well, we were starting to come back up still nothing and uh it was dark it's probably about 11 o'clock at night we came up to the car and uh, what was really cool was uh, i had my father with me and, but he was sitting up in the car. And he's like, who was that? Who was that that came up the trail before y'all and turned to the left, which would be toward our camp? Yeah, it, 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 was, it wasn't any of us. And we're like, we got this thing on, on the DVR too. You know, we're pretty excited about it. <laughs> and as we are playing it back, we see it. And the guy operating the DVR deleted it on accident. It was like, are you kidding me? And it just seems to be that way when you're dealing with this creature, Bigfoot, just seems like you get something good and then something happens or the batteries aren't working or this or that. So we, um, we head back to camp and now it's about midnight. I was the first car in and came into the cul-de-sac and back into the the back of the um, uh, campsite where the tents were right at the, the back of the, the tailgate of the pickup truck. And then another car came in and then another pickup truck. And we're, my dad jumps out. And of course, when you're doing this, you have the dome lights off and you've got the uh, headlamps on and, you know, kind of looking a little goofy, but uh, we all had the same setup. And as uh, my dad jumped out of the truck, went around. So he was on the passenger side, jumped out, and he walked around his truck. So now he's on the driver's side, and he drops the tailgate down. And I'm goofing around there in the uh, the, the truck itself, uh, getting some things ready. I open up my um, the driver's door. And I look down the side of the truck. And I see my dad and he's tailgates down. It's my dad. It's a pine tree, literally three, four feet behind him. There's not much room between the truck and this pine tree. And I just continue to uh, scan. And it was the truck, my father, the tree, a very large tree. And I kind of walk around the door. And as I'm doing that, uh, my friend, Let's call him Tom. Goes Bigfoot, Bigfoot, and he's pointing to my dad. And of course, I hightailed it on the other side of the truck because I didn't want any part of it. I didn't know what was going on. And the nice thing was, I had my thermal in my hand, ran around, 
picked the thermal up and it wasn't there now. It had run 65 feet into the thick brush uh, to the on the driver's side, 65 feet into this thick brush. And I was able to pick it up. I scanned it. I picked it up with this thermal and I start yelling at my father. I could care less about anybody else. I was like, dad, get over here, get over here. And he comes around. We're able to watch this thing with uh, seven of us. We're able to watch it for 15 minutes as it hunkered down in this thick brush, 65 feet away for 15 minutes. And he was kind of hunkered down, kind of like hands on knees. But you can see from just under his armpits and his head. And he was, his head um, was on his shoulders um, going back and forth, like almost like a finch, like a bird's head, because there was another group of people that were a little bit further back and to the right of me. So he was looking at me and then he was looking at that group of people back and forth, back and forth. And this is where I kind of kicked myself. I wish I would have spent that extra $1,500 to get the recordable thermal. Um, but we watched him for about 15 minutes and you can hear his uh, jaws popping. He was chomping on his teeth and you can hear that. So he was, what we took that as is he was um, agitated. And then all of a sudden behind us, we started getting something like thrashing. And uh, I tur when I turned around, so everybody got to see this thing in a thermal and in a night vision. Hold on just a moment. So everything got to see this thing in a thermal and uh, Gen 3. Um, of course, neither one of them were recordable at. So when I turn around to see what's making all the thrashing noise behind us, when I come back around, he's gone. Um, very typical of Bigfoot behavior that I come to find out. If you see one and you focus in on it and he knows that there's going to be another one trying to get the focus off of him so he could or it can escape or, or get away out of danger. Um, the takeaway from that was we were able to um, get the height of the, the animal. He was seven and a half feet tall because he was his head was hitting a pine tree branch, and and Tom was able to measure that, and um, that that was that's when it really really became real for me. And for everybody else. Um, and the crazy thing was this animal was five, six feet behind my dad. So when we pulled in, he got caught in our camp. And there were some bushes behind this pine tree that he got caught behind. So when, when I did the U-turn to back in, he got caught and he hunkered down so we couldn't see him. And then he would have he got stuck there and couldn't get out. Because as soon as I had parked the truck, my father jumped out of the car and, or the truck and dropped the tailgate. So the big pine tree that I had seen it was not a pine tree. That was a big foot. Um, like I said, he was very big, probably four, four and a half feet at, at, the, at the shoulders. Um, and we were able to determine that through the, the thermal. Uh, it had a a V shape down to his waist, very big. Um, and got us, we were, we were all pretty excited about this and uh, nobody could really sleep. And we started doing calls and doing the, the amateur stuff that, um, that we all do, uh, trying to get some sort of reaction and nothing. So that was my first experience <clears throat> and then i'd say about six months later is when i got to meet chuck on an expedition down there and what's pretty neat is chuck if i'm not mistaken that's where you had your sighting uh yes your what your second sighting yeah it was much 
it was my actually uh i had one when we were walking down the right away that night and then um also uh the one that stuck his face into my wit my passenger windshield and right. was looking at me as i was sleeping and yep. and plus the the place that you were talking about uh i, I actually casted my very first print there which was a really unique print because it was it was 14 inches long but uh the pinky toe on the print was broke it it was actually bending back toward the heel the pinky toe was that's and right i remember unfortunately, that. unfortunately uh i busted that thing before i could get it to the house and was never able to put it back together because it broke into lots of pieces but I, w- I was sick over that because that was a pretty unique track right <clears throat> i know that uh, that was the first time i met you and that's where our friendship began and um so i had done some some other expeditions down there in that area with with a number of guys and if we didn't have a sighting we had uh i guess what class b they call it um, sounds, that sort of thing. Calls, wood knocks. It was it was a, a, a pretty hot area for a long time. But after I after that uh, little bit of time that I had down there, I just kind of got out of it. Um, I I had seen one, so I didn't need to prove to myself that they were they were real. And I was able to have other people with me or guide other people to have. Uh, some sort of interaction with these animals. Um, About that same time, I had, I was always going up uh, to Southeast Oklahoma. And uh, absolutely, it's absolutely beautiful up there. Um, I got on a a large deer lease, a 40,000 acre deer lease. I had uh, purchased um, five Mm -hmm. acres, put a cabin on it. And uh, I was going up there at least once, if not twice a month, and hanging out with my buddies and stuff. But we weren't really big footing, or, or I wouldn't. Need to, I never was a researcher. I was more of an experiencer um, throughout this this whole period of my life. And we would have we'd be out on the deer lease, and I mean, and one of my buddies were we were standing. Uh, on one of the logging roads and we had um, our ATVs and we're just kind of standing there and it wouldn't surprise me if we had a beer in our hand and off one of the ridges we had a rock come down and fall right between the two of us and you could hear it go through the the trees and then it landed and then we were both like oh they're here and let's just ignore and see what happens it couldn't have been 30 seconds later, and then we got another another rock. And then we just were like, okay, they're here. We looked up on the ridge, couldn't see anything. We didn't have um, a thermal or anything like that with us, and we just went about our business. And out on the lease, you would, you would have these strange occurrences. Um, there was another time my ex-wife and I and uh, – my buddy and his wife were kind of fishing in a creek, sitting in sitting in the creek, you know, um, with folding chairs and you know just in, enjoying ourselves and just kind of goofing around and chatting and everything. And had my chocolate lab with me, and he was enjoying the water. And all of a sudden, I watched Bo, the lab, kind of run down the side side of the creek, and it, it's thick his haunches are up and then we never saw the tree which is which is crazy but it was close a tree was pushed down and of course uh my buddy knew exactly what was going on and and the women were too busy talking and you know they weren't paying attention but uh, i had to call the lab back because I, i i feel that the the pushing down of a tree that's aggression it's like hey you need to get out of here um so we just kind of packed your stuff up and the, and the women didn't know what was going on we were just like yeah it's, it's just time to get out of here uh with that said 
uh, I had made a list of some of the things that that happened um, in Southeast Oklahoma to me. Um, so I, I had purchased five acres and um, put a cabin on it. And, you know, I think, Chuck, you were one of the first people up there to stay. And I think it was your son. And it was just the two of y'all, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I remember you calling me, I think it was on a Sunday, and said, hey, dude, <laughs> you got Bigfoot on your property. And I was like, oh, God. I don't need to know that. I, I just, you know, it's great that they're around, but I don't want them running around my, my cabin and, and things like that. Cause I had uh, kids at the time. And, uh, that's when you casted that footprint. What was it? A uh, eight foot, eight inch footprint. Some, yeah. Something like that. It was, it was pretty small, but it was definitely, it was definitely a big footprint because the, the dermal ridges on the bottom of the foot were up and down, straight up and down. Yeah. Like ours. Yeah. Well, what's what's really neat is you were able to capture that on yeah. on the uh, the casting, and I, I'd say about two or three weeks later, uh, I had some friends that had found out that I had a cabin in Southeast Oklahoma that were uh, part of a group up in Colorado, and they had reached out to me and said, "Hey," because I had it on Facebook and. Uh, do you have a cabin where I think you have a cabin? I was like, yeah. And um, so we set up a, a little, they set up a mini expedition. I just kind of told them where to go and everything. And they came from Colorado. And I think you know these guys, don't you? Or know of them, Chuck? Uh, no, I've never met them. Okay. Um, so they came out and... They had brought recordable thermals and things like that. And that first night, we kind of sat out on the deck. And the way my five acres is, it's um, it's deep. But on the back side of it, it drops to about 30 feet down to a creek bed. Great swimming hole. And then it goes about 400 yards back. And then it goes up on one of the mountains up there in the Wachita mountains up there. And we started hearing, uh, of course, they did a couple of calls and stuff, and we started getting wood knock and thermal hits, um, but nothing definitive. And they were up there until uh, Sunday night when they had to catch a plane um, Monday morning out of DFW. And they had been out on the lease uh, Saturday night, and they had gotten some samurai chatter. Um, so for them, it was it was a it was a um, it was a win win for everybody. Uh, they got to have some inter- a little bit of interaction. There there was things that were going on, but here's the the kicker. So the front door of the cabin. Uh, when you walk in the door to the right is a guest room and across the hall from that is a, uh, a powder bath, you know, just a toilet and a sink. And at two 30 in the morning, one of the guys woke up because of the corner light motion light came on and he was just like, Oh, wonder what did that it just kind of woke him up and he wasn't really thinking about bigfoot or anything and when he crossed the hall to use the restroom he looked at the front door and the front door has a like a stained glass on it and he saw something about five six five seven at the door and it really it didn't dawn on him because he was still kind of waking up a little bit um as he's standing there going he realized and he put his head leaned back out of the door and there was a gentleman uh, that was sleeping on the couch and he heard the guy get up to go to the bathroom. So he's kind of like, I got to go too. So, so he's standing there and he's watching this figure trying to open the front door. 
And they both, both guys that said, you know, it's five, six, five, seven, nothing, not real broad, anything like that. And um, then all of a sudden, it, it might have seen a shadow inside the cabin, and then it took off. The guys get up at 530, 6, 530, 6 o'clock, something like that. Um, not really. Uh, they got up to, to head back to DFW. And uh, the guy comes out of the, the guest room. The front door is wide open. So whatever was at the front door had actually opened it. And neither one of the guys that had seen this figure thought about dead bolting the door. Um, so I, I remember this and the guys leave and, and they're telling me what had happened that night. And the guys leave, fly back to Colorado. I call Chuck up. And you and I are talking on the phone. And I was telling you kind of what the, what was going on, what what kind of activity we had. And you were like, oh, wait a minute. Did I tell you, this is before I had told you about our visitor at the front door. You popped in and said, oh, did I tell you, you had one trying to get in the front door when me and my son were there. You remember that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Because I, I was sleeping on the couch. And uh, Brett was in one of the rooms and on the backside. And uh, about two or three o'clock in the morning, um, I woke up because I I heard the the doorknob jingling. And uh, lucky for me, I locked the door that night. <laughs> right. Um, and I was like, you know what? That's exactly what happened to us last night. And so we had. You and Brett, and then this group from Colorado, the same thing, literally the same thing happened, the same time of the evening and everything. And um, so let's move forward probably another month or two. And I had just had a garage built on the front side of the, the cabin. I had power washers, lawnmowers, things like that on the back porch. And I'd gotten up there, the, the garage had just gotten finished and had all this stuff on the back porch. And I'd come up there by myself and just to move everything in the garage. And um, I started moving stuff and I got this kind of creepy feeling. Uh, nothing alarming, but like I was being watched and um, so I just made this this silly whoop sound, and I got a whoop right back. But it was um, I wish I could mimic it, um, but it just it it was off, um, like a child was doing it versus uh, an adult. There, there there's a difference there, and I was like, oh, just what I need, something else. Uh, up here with me while I'm moving this stuff. Um, so about over the next hour, as I'm moving stuff back and forth from uh, the back porch to the garage, I would occasionally do a whoop and I would get this kind of whoopy sound back. And after about the third or fourth time, it really didn't bother me. It was like if something was gonna happen, it would have already happened. And it was coming from the same area of the woods so I get everything back and about uh, 30 yards from the back of the cabin is a deck that overlooks uh, this creek and everything. And I went down and uh, got my little wireless hotspot and I had a chimney and I started a little fire down there and I was going to watch a movie on the deck and it was just an absolutely gorgeous night. And um, I kind of made this whoop sound again and I got it back from the same area. So I walked back up to the cabin, I grabbed my pistol and I grabbed my thermal. And I went back down to the deck and turned the thermal on. And literally within 60 yards of where I was at, there was this, I say small figure. It was um, 
five, six, five, seven, slender, almost like a preteen child kid. Um, and it was just kind of squatted down, like sitting on the sitting on its heels with knees bowed out and was just kind of pulling itself, hopping around, almost like a, what, how a chimpanzee sits. But it was messing around in the, um, the leaf litter. And I could see that it was not a male. Um, there wasn't anything hanging, should I say. So that was my first sighting there at my cabin. And I watched it for about 15, 20 minutes and just went back inside. Um, I didn't feel threatened or anything like that. It was just, oh, there's one there. Um, once again, I wish I would have spent the $1,500 and gotten the, uh, the cordable thermal. So that was the first time I had seen one there at the cabin. And fast forward another month and a half, two months. I'm going through a divorce, and so every weekend I was spending my time up at the cabin as much time as possible just to kind of clear my head and everything. And uh, the master bedroom uh, is at the front of the, the cabin, and I sleep with the blinds open because 100 yards to my right, I've got a deer feeder there. And I like to wake up and there's a power pole that comes uh, from the street and it's, it's near the, the feeder. So the light's always on. And I'd like to watch the deer and stuff. And over the next three, four weeks, I had this young, I want to say preteen female Bigfoot. She would come around from the right side of the woods and she'd make this big loop between the house and the um, deer feeder uh, far enough out where she wasn't kicking on the motion lights on the right side of the house on both corners. She'd make this big loop and then she would cut in to the front door, which would automatically kick on that light. And uh, she would come to the door and she would mess with the door. Uh, the first two times it was, it was startling. Um, I didn't feel real comfortable. Um, I wasn't sleeping at night just with everything that was going on in my life. So I just kind of laying there and she would do this. And I yelled at her a couple of times and she'd run off. And then finally I thought, well, shoot, I'm going to try getting this thing on my cell phone. At the angle, I put my head up uh, against the window trying to get um, at least something of her uh, that I could just never get the right angle and everything uh, to get a video of her. And then I'd yell at her and then she'd run off. And I don't want to say it was a game, but uh, the last time she had done this, she had left me a little wind chime on the front porch steps, which I thought was really neat. Um, so that was three years ago, I want to say it was. Um, hey, Sean. Does anybody? Yeah. I was told to say that, that uh, she actually has the hots for for me and me and you. It wouldn't surprise me. Uh, <laughs> it's you know it's it, it's 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 really neat that that um, I've had other people up there that have had experiences when I'm not there. Um, I do have guests that go up there and they, they'll stay. Um, they'll let me back up a little bit. So uh, after this, since, it, since it's, a, it's, it's in a remote area of Oklahoma, I've put security cameras up. Um, I think I've got like seven of them, eight of them up just on the cabin itself. And that pretty much stopped everything. And, I, and I'm guessing it has to do with the IR lights. Um, it stopped them from coming up to the cabin itself, um, which is a little disappointing, but because um, I was hoping maybe to catch something. But I didn't put the cameras up there to catch them. It was just for security. Um, but 
after that, I'd have uh, friends go up there, stay at the cabin with their families and stuff, and they would get calls off the deck. They would get wood knocks. Um, they've even had acorns thrown at them. Uh, they seem to, uh, when there's somebody new up there, they kind of come in and investigate uh, to see who's up there. Uh, I don't know if they know my name or not, but hey, Sean's not up there. So, um, you know, that's, does anybody have I mean, any questions or anything? Well, when me and Mary Fabian and her sister Debbie um, were at the cabin, um, we we heard we heard them come up on the deck that night, the last night we were there, and uh, the the door handle was jingling that night too as well, and plus we were getting rocks thrown at us, and that was something new that we hadn't experienced there. I don't think, unless right. you know, unless you ex- had experienced it before not so i haven't um i know like i said guests have um i think they're kind of used to me that i'm not i go up there and stay up there by myself quite a bit and i i don't really get any that feeling that i'm being watched or anything i do know that they're around because you can hear them uh, on the backside of that mountain, making calls and, and, and things like that. Uh, just last weekend, my fiance and I and her daughter were up there. I want to say it was like five o'clock in the afternoon. And we were going through a walk through the woods and we heard two calls, uh, about 10, 10 minutes apart from each other. Um, now, my daughter, who's uh, she's in her early 20s, she'll go up there with her friends. And um, at the time, I had issues with the security system, and it was down. Um, they had the cabin smacked a couple of times while they were there. And my daughter called me, you know, hey, what do I do? And uh, really, there's not much you can do. Um, she is very proficient with a large caliber pistol. So, you know, worst case scenario, you know, shoot up in the air, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, just uh, last year, uh, a year ago, January, my fiance and I were sitting up there, the cabin, and we had a slap on the side of the cabin. And it's a it's a heavy cabin, and it shook the cabin. Um, it was like, oh, they're here. Okay. But um, as far as being aggressive, anything like that, I feel a heck of a lot safer up there than I do down here <laughs> where I live. Um, you know, we do have bears up there. Uh, the bears don't bother bother anybody. The only thing that I'd be concerned about is snakes and um, mountain lions. Um, but, uh, you know, going back to the door being jingled, you know, the joke around the cabin is go ahead, deadbolt the doors. It's kind of the joke, and you get people that are, are non-believers, um, and they'll be the first ones that will lock that door when they come in. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Well, I've got a couple of other uh, experiences if you guys would like to hear them. Absolutely. All right. So this this past year, I go elk hunting every year in Southern Colorado. Um, I'd say about uh, four years ago, we were hunting up there, and it's a it's a family kind of get together for all the the men of the family. We all get together and hunt there. Uh, Brother in law uh, put in for the wrong zone or unit in Colorado, and he got uh, caught. He didn't know he had put in for the wrong one, but. Uh, ran into a game warden that was up there. He came back to uh, the lodge that we were staying at because he wanted to see the license and do all the formalities of giving uh, my brother-in-law a ticket. And my dad came out and as the game warden was coming in, he's like, hey, are there Bigfoot up here? And that was just being annoying uh, to say the least. And the game warden's like, no, you know, I've got hundreds of game cameras up here to track the Canadian lynx. You know, there's nothing up here like this, blah, 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 blah. And um, 
what was really cool was the game warden sat with us on open, second season of elk rifle. Spent three hours telling us how they caught uh, poachers and how they used DNA and all this stuff. And uh, my brother-in-law got off with a pretty light ticket. Thank goodness. It was just an accident. But um, as he was leaving, uh, my dad was following out the game game warden and I was with him. And my dad goes, are you sure there's no Bigfoot out here? And he looked at my dad, dead eye, and he goes, they're here. I'm not saying anything else. Gets in his truck and drives off. Um, so kind of fast forward to this year, I'm in the same zone unit. And uh, one of the guys that, uh, that came down from Colorado on that expedition that they did at the cabin, uh, he was with me. We were about uh, four miles into a walk, and I'm about 30 feet ahead of him. And he goes, Sean. And I'm like, yes, I know. And we had walked into an area that had stick structures galore. Trees pulled up uh, into kind of the TP kind of um, shapes. And we're both kind of looking around. And then about, let's say, 75, 80 yards away from us, a squirrel starts going off, you know, doing that, that chatter like, uh, there's a predator around here. So uh, me and my buddy sat down for a little bit and waiting to see which way the squirrel was going to go because uh, they'll follow a predator out of their area and then you know, about 10 minutes 15 minutes the the squirrel stopped and we're kind of looking around going yeah we knew what that was so we go back to uh, camp uh, that that evening and kind of telling our story what we walked up on the next day um, my cousin's husband comes back and he goes yeah, it was about a quarter mile from where you guys were at. And there was a howl, how do you say it? Howler monkey going off. And it was coming from the same area that uh, me and my buddy were at. And then the next day, my cousin in the same area was getting wood knocks, not too far from them. Um, so this area seems to have some, some there. Uh, and I had walked this area for 15, 20 years while elk hunting and just never paid any attention uh, like a lot of people do when they're out in the woods. You know, uh, my, uh, my attention was to see some movement like an elk, that sort of thing. And I had walked past these for years. That's if they were there when I'd walked through them. I, we couldn't really tell if they were new or old. But some of the trees had uh, root balls on them. Um, so that was, that was pretty, uh, pretty neat. Um, let me see. Uh, and then going back on, on the deer lease, um, people have had rocks thrown at their, people will take their trailers up on, on this, this deer lease and, and they, it, the deer lease, like I said, is 40,000 acres. So you could go 20 miles back up in there and, there's no light pollution. There's nothing. And they'll hear calls coming from one mountain uh, ridge to the other. They've had uh, rocks thrown at them, uh, things scream at them, that sort of thing. Um, it wasn't too long ago when I was up there on my section of the lease on uh, there's a gas line that runs through it. And there was a new guy that was on the lease and uh, I was kind of showing them how I, you have to hang your feeders up there else the, the bears will tear them down. And he looks down the, down the, uh, the cast line and goes, I think I just saw a bear run across uh, the trail up there. It was, it was a ways away. <laughs> and I kind of chuckled on. And I made this silly call. And right after that, we got a call back. And you never saw anybody want to get off a deer lease fast, <laughs> faster. Um, and then there's been um, sightings where 
a friend of mine's uh, wife was having coffee about uh, 6.30 in the morning. It was, it was pretty dark out still. And across the creek, she had seen somebody that she thought she recognized or I want to say recognize it more, more of like a shadow. You can't see color. So saw the outline of somebody walking on the other side of the creek and she yelled out the, the name of the guy that she thought it was. And she said it stopped and it looked at her and she goes, yeah, that that's, that's not him. <laughs> and then it just looked at her and just walked off. Uh, so there's, there's that area of Southeast Oklahoma is a hotbed for them. Um, oh yeah, uh, my neighbor, um, he's had them. What, what's funny with that area is the locals either believe or they don't. And there's generations there that that just don't believe that have had no sightings or they just don't pay attention. Um, I've had friends tell me that they're that they've seen them crossing a the road up there. Um, my neighbor has had him come up to his shop and uh, there's a particular candle that kept showing up on a stump by his, um, by his workshop. And he didn't think anything of it. And he just, over a few week time, he picked the candle up and put it back on the table underneath like the carport. And then the candle would end up back up on the stump. Um, and he was hunting a, a couple of years ago, maybe two, three years ago. And uh, his wife had shot a deer up in the thick woods and he was up there helping her uh, clean it. Well, she had shot it, came back to get him. So he goes back up there and as they're approaching the deer, they got this huge roar. He said it wasn't a bear. Um, you know, living up there, you know what a bear sounds like, that sort of thing. He said it punched him in the chest, the, the reverberation from this roar. And it was just on the other side of the deer. And he's like, you know what, hon? Whatever that was, you can have it. And um, that was one of his stories. And another one, they got uh, pushed out of the woods. They weren't hunting. They were just hiking back up in there. Like I said, one of the mountains is behind our cabin. And uh, so he's back up in there with four of his other, with four family member, four family members. And um, they were being paced out. And from the woods to his house is about 300, 400 yards. And it dips down and then it comes back up to where his house is. And they were, they were being pushed out and they just, they weren't running, but they were walking extremely fast. And he was kind of pushing his family. Let's go, let's go, let's go. They, they cross the pasture and they get back up and everybody else is going into the house. He turns around. He said there was a figure, um, a bulky figure on two legs. But this is the kicker here. He said it had its nose in the air sniffing. He could see that. And that goes into something that I don't even want to think about. Is it is it, the primates don't do that, from what I know of. Um, stories around that area of them, but um, and that's uh, that's only about six hundred yards from my cabin. But uh, but yeah, that's kind of my story in a nutshell. Uh, my experiences and stuff. And one thing that I'd, I'd like to say is um, if anybody ever tracks down uh, who I am or where my cabin is, uh, you come on my property, I will file trespassing. You will get cited for that. I, I don't want people around my place. Um, so that's it. So and what about the... Uh... The, the friend of yours who built the house and uh, he was up there roofing the house or whatever. And there was oh, one that's... walking across, walking across the ridge line, screaming at him as he was up on the roof. Oh, so a buddy of mine, this is before I, uh, I had met him. Uh, 
had bought uh, about 40 acres up there and his house backs up to one of the mountains. So uh, if you look at the back of his house, it's actually touching the mountain. And then it, when the house comes off, it's got uh, legs. So when you're up on the roof, you're, you're looking at the side of the mountain. And uh, he moved up there kind of for the whole Bigfoot thing. Uh, he had the opportunity to get a job up there and everything. And he decided he was going to build his own cabin, which is absolutely stunning. But one evening he was up there. <clears throat> and this is before cell phone reception was in the area. Uh, he didn't have a, a landline. He was kind of roughing it, and uh, he was up there um, putting his roof on, and he looked across and directly at him, or directly across from him on the mountain, was a young Bigfoot that was walking and stopped and was sitting there watching him <laughs> build his roof. And that was the first time that he had ever um, seen one in, in real life person, whatever. And nerved him enough to have him drive 40 miles uh, to the nearest uh, payphone and called his <laughs> called one of our friends and said, I don't think I can do this. It unnerved him that much. But uh, he's like, you know, I don't want to say that they're they're docile up there, but I think there's enough human interaction that they give us enough space and we give them enough space that um, I haven't really heard of any aggressive behavior from any of them. You know, the rock throwing, um, I think that's kind of a, are you paying attention kind of thing. Um, now, I did have the tree that was pushed down. Um, but other than that, it's, it's, as far as them coming up and, you know, uh, damaging things anything like that i've never heard of anything like that uh now i have heard of them going in and stealing chickens and a goat or something will go missing occasionally but it's it's not an issue well does anybody have any questions while we're we're fixing to have to wrap up and does anybody get any questions that like like to ask well i got a comment to make chuck <clears throat> And Chuck probably knows where I'm going with this. I'm the one that was gigging him about uh, um, the hairy, hairy lady having <laughs> the hot, the hot yeah. for you guys. And even though I say that in jest, let me explain to you that that is not an unusual behavior with uh, Bigfoot. And it is a very much of a primate behavior because people that have um, some of these pets, chimpanzees, uh, I'm talking about the higher apes and such, <clears throat> and even gorillas do get, they do make attachments to humans, whether it be male or female. The females like the males, and uh, uh, Robin Williams, if he was alive today, could tell you the story about Coco. She didn't want him to leave. She fell in love with him, and um, they thought they were going to have to <laughs> unwrap him from from her because she had him all bundled up and was like she was ready to keep him and anyway but uh, the thing that I did Chuck if you remember I did tell you that you know when y'all you had told me that uh, you were having rocks thrown at the cabin when you were up there with uh, Mary Fabian and I believe yeah. it was her sister that she was with and I'm, I'm going to tell you I, it would not surprise me in the least if it was the hairy lady throwing rocks because she might have not been real happy about the fact that you were up there with uh, two two females. Uh-oh, jealousy. Mm. Yeah. Well, the, the funny thing, I say funny, but um, the interesting thing is we do know uh, somebody else has seen this, uh, that the young one uh, comes around with the female. There's a bigger female that uh, is usually with the younger one. So it's, it's like a, a mother daughter kind of thing. Um, the female is about, um, I was told when it was seen with the younger one, about six, no more than six and a half feet tall. Um, and that was seen off the deck. And then there's a large male 
that um, runs with them as well. Um, so we do know that there's three, uh, the large male and then the mother and then the daughter, like the preteen, which I don't think she'd be preteen now after three years, but uh, she was, when I noticed, when I had seen the smaller one, you know, kind of lanky, um, the long arms. Um, I've seen a picture that was drawn uh, a couple months ago that looks identical to what she looks like as she uh, as she walked, and it, it was a it was an odd walk. We I couldn't mimic it. Uh, her back was kind of straight, and it, it was like the legs were doing everything, and the head, of course, wasn't moving. But she just would make this big arc from the woods to the right, all the way to the left of the cabin and would, would, would come in. Um, very fluent, but odd. And she was at um, like a Irish setter red brown color. Um, when I, when she had come to the door and I had my face pressed up against the window, the only thing that I could really see was the back of her head, which was the back of the head was flat. And it was almost like it was the back of the head, neck, shoulders. It was almost like a straight line. Um, no neck at all? No. Uh, it, it just an odd, gangly-looking... Like I said, the, the best way to describe it is like a preteen, kind of goofy. The, the way she moved, it was just, it was just odd. Milo, um, do you have any questions? Milo's being quiet. Let's see if he's here. <laughs> oh, he's there. He's just on mute. Milo. Oh. Maybe, maybe. I might forget to unmute. Maybe. Maybe he might he might be tied up at the moment. No, oh, I was there he is. plug. <laughs> do you have do you have anything to ask Milo or bring up? It, it, my observation of that is it sounds like this is all like juvenile stuff or like what I just heard is like jealousy because this this hairy lady sounds like uh, she was toying with everybody instead of trying to hurt somebody kind of thing. So right. They, but uh, um, your the place you live is it? Uh, what's the topography? I mean, is it uh, hilly? Is it? Uh, it's mountainous. It's mountainous. It's the 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 Wachita Mountains. Okay. So I'm in. I'm actually in a valley. And behind me, it goes straight up probably about 1,800 feet, you know, within a mile, if that. I mean, it's just my property, and then you go a few hundred yards, and then it just goes straight up. It's difficult to walk. And then across the street, I've got neighbors, and then probably a half mile, then it, then it shoots back up into the mountains again. So I'm in a valley. Okay. I, I, I was just trying to figure, you know, I mean, it's like... You know, most people will say they are they their their houses here or most cabins because I live in Washington State and everything around here is woods and serious mountains. So a foothill here is like four thousand, five thousand feet. And so yeah. we we get some crazy stuff here and uh the the time of year that I've just been listening to on, on a couple other broadcasts is mostly during the cool times, you know, like your spring, what is it? Early spring and fall will, is that mostly actually summer when and things happen? Summer and fall are the top peak seasons of the year for these creatures activity. Yeah. Isn't that, isn't that by where, I mean, isn't that by where you live though? I mean, most because I was listening to one is so like it was spring and winter or or spring and fall, not really winter. Well, there's going to be some variance, you know, depending on the area and, and the creatures aren't just going to hunker down and they don't hibernate. So you're going right. to get some activity yeah. during throughout the year. But the majority of sightings occur during summer and fall. OK, so, so uh, I'd say about four years ago, uh, once the, when the cabin first got there, 
we had a, a blistery winter uh, front come through and I had gotten up there late with my wife at the time, um, late on a Friday night. It was snowing and the wind was coming out of the north. So it was kind of, it was pushing and I had gone down to the deck and I've got a huge spotlight that overlooks the creek. So when the kids want to go swimming at night, they can, it's like a football uh, like you know, football stadium. Like I click that on and I gotten a roar, a punch roar that it hit me. Cause as soon as I turned the light on, he was on the, I'm going to say he, cause that's what it felt like was just on the other side of the creek. When I turned that light on, it was just one of those, Whoa! but it had this reverberation into my chest. I just shut the light off. I walked back up inside and my wife at the time said, is that what I thought I heard? And I'm like, yep. And this was going against a strong northerly wind. So she heard it inside the house and it was 75, 80 yards away going against a, a gusty wind. Wow. So, hey, uh, Forrest, I have a question about that. Because when I heard that, uh, when he said uh, reverberation, like it hit him in the chest and stuff. Now, is that more like a a, a male kind of thing? Or is, do the females do that kind of thing, too, in the, in, in the ape world thing? Well, you can have females growl at you, but they don't they don't have the power uh, to really uh, make the 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 really loud roars and such like that. You hear that generally from the, the males that do that. Um, the gorillas, uh, the gorillas are really good at it. Chimps, uh, yes, but not, they're not, they're not near as powerful as the, the sounds that the gorillas make. So, but you don't hear, uh, I mean, like I said, the females can, uh, growl and, and make uh, noises, uh-huh. but they're just, they don't, they don't have the power that the males do. I mean, it's just like, uh, the sexual dichotomy between, uh, you know, males and females, humans too. So, you know, huh. Not in my book. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are some females out there that can make a lot of noise. <laughs> Milo, this is, or, like, Milo, are you talking what? about your sister? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. Now, now, guys, be nice. <laughs> but like I said, this thing had such a punch to it that yeah. it was just like, I just shut the light right off and said, okay, I'm out of here and just march myself my happy butt back up to the cabin. Um, you know, in, in, you know, I, I, I talk about my cabin because that's where I've had all 90% of my, um, uh, occurrences and everything, but I know that I'm not the only one that has this thing, these, these things happening, uh, in the Valley where I'm at. I do know that my neighbor has it, and I know a couple of other people that have had things that were very similar. Um, and and we would expect occur. that too. You know, if something's going on yeah. in one place, it's going to be going on in the whole area as a as a in general. Right. But I've never had anything stolen, anything like that. I was gifted that little wind chime um, that one time, um, and. I can usually tell when they're around. Uh, it's because the deer at my deer feeder, there's they're nowhere to be found. And I feed I feed year round. I don't hunt those deer. They're kind of like pets. But there'll be times when there's nothing around for that evening or two three nights in a row. And then yeah, I look at my game cameras and. They're there every single night, every single morning. You know, they're, they, they're hunkered down at, at this corner of my property. And then all of a sudden they're gone and then they come back. The birds don't come to the feeders. The squirrels don't come to the feeders. It's just like, it's just dead. Damn, I had a good question about that. That sounds really cool. My brain doesn't work like everybody else's. Just like I got to turn off so I can think. Well, but, uh, there there are several. I've got other friends that have that have had experiences there at the cabin and also in the woods there, uh, not just uh, Chuck and, and the guys from um, Colorado. Um, 
you know, just family that have gone up there and they're believers now and they, they don't talk about what what they have seen. They're just like, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of done kind of thing. So. Well, Sean, uh, Sean, we're just about out of time, but really appreciate you coming on and telling us all this stuff and, and absolutely keep in touch with us. Oh, yes. Yes, and um, Chuck will probably be up in the next month or two up there, hopefully, and maybe he can come back with some uh, neat stories. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. Yeah. That was really cool. Hey, I got one question, and I understand this whole thing about secrecy with your cabin. Can you tell where what town you live by? Nope. Uh, I, okay. I'll tell you privately, Milo. Uh, okay. I, I was just trying to look for the map, you know, a map where... You know, never mind. I got a. It's just the military part in me. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you. It's good. I'll talk to you later, Milo. I'll let you know. Um, yeah, we, cool. We gotta we gotta protect his privacy there. So yeah, I I got gotcha. you. Thank you. That's why I asked. All right. Anybody All else right. have anything? Thanks. I appreciate you guys letting me come on and and, and share my uh, my story. Sean, we are honored. Thank you. Thank you. Guys, you guys have a blessed rest of the weekend. You do the same, my friend, and everyone, thanks for joining us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open out there.